When the battle was being fought between the church of Christ and man-made denominations, and when brethren were willing to consistently contend earnestly for the faith in public discussion, no questions were of more importance than the time, I say the time, when and the place where the church of our Lord was inaugurated, set up, and established. A clear conception of its origin has much to do with a correct understanding of what the will of the Lord is. I pause here to simply say today very few, I'm sorry to say even many in the church, care little about the details taught in the last will and testament of our Lord, he who built the church, he who purchased the church, about the identifying marks of the church. It set it apart, especially from denominationalism, but from all other religions. That is just a comment that reflects upon our own concern for the truth as it's applied to anything pertaining to how God saves man and our responsibility to him in our own salvation. Now let me point out that by church, we mean that spiritual realm over which Christ reigns as head and in which God dwells. Now, let it be firmly stated that no such an institution existed upon this earth until the first Pentecost day following the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Denominationalism is founded upon the opposite of this fundamental truth. And so, those who are part of that human system, their minds are blinded, and there is a veil over their faces until this day. They don't even believe the church has any connection with one's salvation from sin and the journey God would have us make in going to heaven. But it does. I often think, well, is there more that I can do as a Christian and as a preacher in trying to spread the borders of the kingdom? That's always been on my mind for a long, long time. And yet, as I grow older, understanding in a wise sense more about the work of the church and my obligations to God, I realize that if you can keep, let's say, the spring church of Christ and all that that means scripturally, if you can keep those people who make it up, those brothers and sisters of the Lord, those Christians who are part of this congregation, properly informed, trained, and taught, then you have done a great thing for the cause of Christ. Because if every other congregation of God's people would do that, then guess what? It's sort of like saying, well, you know, Noah was a sad failure before the flood. He only saved him and his family. Listen, everybody else done that. It would have been a flood. You can do everything you need to do in being faithful to God as a member of the Lord's church in this congregation. That doesn't mean we're against cooperation. But when you cooperate with other congregations, they too must be faithful to God. For we have no right to fellowship with them according to the teaching of the Bible if they're not. If we will do all God says Christians are to do as members of this church, then we will understand the importance of such a study as the establishment of the universal church of our Lord as that term is defined and used in the New Testament. Now Daniel prophesied 600 years before the birth of Christ that the time would come when God, the God of heaven, the one, the true, the living God, would set up a kingdom. Now the Jews expected such, even though they had a false concept of the Messiah and the kingdom, and even the design and purpose of them as a nation and the law of Moses. They still looked for a kingdom. They understood that God would set up a kingdom, and they were looking for it to come. They were looking for someone in the power of God 
to come proclaiming himself king over that kingdom. And when finally Jesus Christ of Nazareth appeared, here's what he declared. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Mark 1.15 now, back over in the Old Testament in the book of Daniel, you'll remember as Daniel reminded Nebuchadnezzar of the dream that he had and the great image in the dream and what the parts of that image represented, that he said that the God of heaven would set up a kingdom in the days of the fourth earthly kingdom represented by a part of that figure. Now, Nebuchadnezzar, he said, was that head of gold. That is, the Babylonian kingdom was represented in that way. Following it was the Medo-Persian Empire. Then uh, the Greek Empire, established, of course, by the conquest of uh, Alexander the Great. And following it, the Romans. And he says it's in the days of that fourth empire, in the days of the Romans, that the God of heaven would set up a kingdom which would never be destroyed. Now the Jews, while they were mixed up on a lot of things, understood they were in that fourth kingdom. At least those faithful and determined to follow the law and the prophets and would study, they, they knew that. They knew what Daniel had written. They could think as well as we can. And they understood that. And when we open the New Testament... We find in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 1 that in those days there came one John the baptizer saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Those were the days, as I've said, when the Caesars were on the throne as it were. They wouldn't have called it that, but that's what it was. Of imperial Rome. And you had the Herods ruling locally in Palestine. Now, according to whether you take the new calendar that puts the church established in A.D. 30 or the one we've always used, established in A.D. 33, and we won't get into which one's more accurate, then somewhere around uh, the late 20 A.D., Jesus also said in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 17, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Then a little later, closer to the actual time the church was established in Jerusalem. In Matthew chapter 10, you'll remember that Jesus sent forth the twelve under the first commission, we may very well call it, to the Jews. And here's what he had them say to their hearers. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Then when you come and read in Luke chapter 10, you have the 70 sent out. Again, a limited commission, limited to the Jews. And he ordered the 70 to say, The kingdom of God is come nigh or near unto you. In the sixth chapter of the book of Matthew, he taught his own disciples to pray, for they were praying as things were at that time. Thy kingdom come. Then just about a year before he was to die, he said uh, to his disciples, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 18, 3. Now if we pause here and refer you back to all this speaking about the kingdom, obviously the kingdom at that time was very near to be established. All of this shows that fact. And yet the kingdom or the church had not at that time been established. Again, I emphasize but that such an event was at hand. It had come nigh or near to them. Well, then in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, after the apostle Peter had confessed that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, 
Jesus declared that upon this rock I will build my church. Now this could not mean that he intended only to merely enlarge what some people say already existed. For some have taught that the church started the day of John the Baptist. And they're not consistent because some of the same people go back and say it started in the days of Abraham. He didn't say he was going to enlarge an already existing institution. Notice that Jesus said, I will build my church. But he says he will build it upon the truth that Peter confessed that he is the son of God. It can't be some sort of enlargement of a building already existing. He starts from the foundation up. And that must be kept in mind. Well, time passes. And the Savior then said in the 22nd division of the book of Luke in verse 18... Concerning the institution of the Lord's Supper and when he would partake of it. He said, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. So it's not yet established. In Mark chapter 9 and verse number 1, our Lord said that there be some of them that stand here which shall not taste of death till they've seen the kingdom of God come with power. Now I want you to think about the information we're having supplied to us from the Holy Spirit that can help us understand one of the identifying marks of the church that belongs to Christ that he built over which he reigns as head and in, to which he adds all those who whom he saves. Christ here plainly says that some of whom he was speaking would live to see the kingdom come, come with power. Notice the kingdom is to come with power. But when, we must ask, did the power come? Well, after his resurrection from the dead, Christ told the apostles, tarry or wait in the city of Jerusalem. And you're to wait Till something happens. So until it happens, you stay there. Tear ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. Luke 24 and verse 49. Now when you open the book of Acts, Luke is writing where he left off in the book of Luke, the gospel of Luke. And in verse uh, 8 of chapter 1, here's what he said. That is, he records Jesus saying it. Jesus speaking to the apostles said, Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. Now I don't think those passages we've noted are difficult to comprehend. But I do think they demand a little thinking with the information supplied that we can draw a conclusion that is accurate. I want you to note, number one, the kingdom and power were to come together. Would be a kingdom coming and then power later on, or power coming and then later on the kingdom. But the next point is the power and the Holy Spirit were to come together. It wouldn't be the Holy Spirit coming and something happening and then later on power coming or power from some other source happening later on the Holy Spirit came. The power and the Spirit were to come, were to come together. And then the third point is, is that the Holy Spirit came on the first Pentecost, the Jewish feast day, the first Pentecost after the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. All of that simply recorded, plainly recorded in Acts 2 verses 1 through 4. So, from these inspired statements of facts, undeniable, the conclusion that the church was established on the first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ is forced upon us. In other words, when you take the facts in their context and reason correctly with them, then that's inescapable. You may not want to believe it, but if you go with the facts and you're honest with the facts, it just pushes you there. That's what logic will do. As somebody said 
Uh, people don't oppose logic till logic opposes them, and then they find out what they love more than the truth. No living man can refute this simple argument or arguments that's made. And our brethren of a generation ago, when conviction of truth meant a whole lot to people in this nation, and especially in the Lord's church, and in religions in general, when they lived, then this little simple argument pressed and set out brought many people to the understanding of the New Testament church. Because any church that started before the first Pentecost fall and resurrection of Christ, no matter what else it may have in it that's truth, can't be the Lord's church. And any church that came after the first Pentecost fall and resurrection of Christ, as Luke record, records in Acts chapter 2, cannot be the Lord's church. It's that simple if people want the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth having to do with when the church began. We would do well sometimes to study church history of the last 175 years in America, I'm speaking of, because one thing stands out very clear 19th century especially, but up through the first 50 years, but especially the first 30 years of the 20th century. And that's how many debates were held. Joe Warlick, gospel preacher, some of you haven't heard of, and that would have been impossible to say as a faithful member of the church in 1940. Brother Warlick died in 1941. He was born in 1866. He preached his first sermon in 1885. The next year he held his first debate, and before he died, he had held 399 debates. He debated people that in my lifetime you can't get to get on the polemic platform to debate. But they did then, and there's a reason for that, folks. They had conviction. They may be wrong. But they believe they had the truth. Truth is objective, and we know we're right, and you're saying we're wrong, and we'll argue it with you. Folks, I pause here from this study to simply say we have seen the, the whole disposition of the mindset, the whole disposition of America in the church and out change regarding truth and being convicted by it. What we've heard for the last, I don't know how many years, 60 years probably, to one extent or the other, but especially the last 40 years, is it, it just doesn't make that much difference about what is right and what is wrong or if there is a right and a wrong. So nobody really has any interest in discussing when the church started or how does one become a Christian. What is scriptural worship? What is the scriptural term the Bible uses or terms as the case may be? to reference the church. People don't care. It's just that simple. And many of them are in the Lord's church. And you say, well, how, how do I know that? Look around about you. People are doing all they can, those who consider themselves members of the church of Christ, they're doing all they can to tell the denominations, we as good as you are, and we'll accept you where you are and with what you believe. And the denominations say, well, that's all right. What is it we believe? Because that's where we are regarding objective truth on anything in America today. You see, you can't have debates dealing with when did the Lord's church start. And that being important to people, except that they believe in absolute objective truth and that the truth of the Bible is absolute and objective, but it's inspired truth and it's infallible. And we need the authority of Christ as set out in the words of the New Testament behind what we believe and what we practice. Nobody cares. And we must never allow the world or weak brethren to cause us not to care about the truth on any point. Jesus said, If you continue in my words, then are you my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John 8, 31, 32. Father, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. John 17, 17. That doesn't mean anything anymore. You know what we've got now that substitutes for the proclamation and defense of the gospel? 
that bunch of hairy outfits, the duck crowd. You know they're all supposed to be members of the church. What do they call that thing? What? Duck Dynasty. That's about as good a way as to refer to the church of which they're a member as, as anything, as a Duck Dynasty. Maybe some of you don't know that they claim to be members of the church. They are. One of them's the elder. And the Whitesbury Road Church, which has been a church that's been very loose with the gospel for many, many years. I was raised just about 100 miles north of that congregation. And it's been 40 years ago or longer since they took a stand for the truth because it's the truth of God's Word and only because it's the truth of God's Word on any and every subject. And that's what we've got. Now you think about that on public television representing members of the church. Now if you haven't watched it, I don't recommend it except to watch it so you'll know not to watch it. They're crude and they're rude and they are off color and yet... They're being used. There's been just um, recently, if you go to the Whitesbury Road website, you can see the man that's an elder who's the head of the clan, if you want to call it that, and he's making a comment as to about how he became a Christian, what all. And then they're so popular, of course, we have to get on the popularity wagon, that the president of Oklahoma Christian University uh, had a little thing made with him, a video made with him. They're in demand about coming around to the various churches of Christ to speak, all because of popularity, all because they made a hit secularly, and because they are to represent pure, primitive New Testament Christianity and Christians in the church. I'd rather you watch that, watch it two or three times. Knowing if you know what the New Testament teaches, what a Christian is, and what should represent the Lord's church, and, and you will stand amazed at people. They're, they won't talk about when was the church established, or the importance of the identifying marks of the church. Those identifying marks that guide us to find the Lord's church and know the difference in it and human churches are being... Uh, they're just being washed away. They're being blurred because we want to be like the nations round about us. Nowadays, it seems that if you sin not claiming to be a Christian, then it's a sin and bad. But as a Christian, if you do what is worldly, but because you're a Christian and active in the church, some way or the other, it sanctifies that sin and makes it a godly thing. Now, you may say, well, that's you're stretching it. No, it, it's just showing how people do. As a Christian, if I do this, it makes it all right because I'm a Christian and I'm active, or I'm an elder, or I'm a preacher, or I'm involved in everything with this congregation. I know of no better way for the Satan to get worldliness into the church and just completely destroy the church than what God wants it to be. And that's where we are in this nation today regarding religions. When Jesus was thus exalted at the right hand of God, where he was made, you'll remember, king of kings and lord of lords. He then sent forth the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, to give, if you please, life and energy to that material made ready by John the Baptizer, the forerunner of the Christ. Because that's what he was to do, the Jews. And on the limited commission, that's what they were to do. In the physical creation of the world. It all started by miracle. Go back and read the first few verses and see each person of the great Godhead involved. And as in the physical material creation, it all started by miracle, then God by his own power set up the laws of procreation and all the other physical laws that govern us even to this very day and upheld by the word of his power. But you'll see it was the Holy Spirit who came over this mass of creation and gave it order. And you'll see as the Holy Spirit works in the church that he gives it order. And we have the laws as to how one becomes a Christian and how one lives a Christian life and all the multitudinous details to that. And you can find that in the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Ephesians 6, 17. The gospel was on that first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ 
proclaimed in its fullness. And the apostle Peter, standing up with the other apostles, used the keys of the kingdom that the Holy Spirit infallibly put in his mind and guided him and the other apostles to infallibly state the truth of it, to open the door of the kingdom, the church. And when men were convicted of their sins by the proclamation of the truth that they had killed the Son of God, and they had been brought to believe in Christ as the Messiah, the Savior, verse 37 of Acts 2, they cried out unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And as believers, he told them in verse 38, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for unto the remission or forgiveness of your sins. And then when you read verse 41 and verse 42 and verse 47, you see the Lord added those who obeyed the gospel and being baptized for the remission of sins to the church he built and shed his blood to purchase, Acts 20 and verse 28. Now throughout the Old Testament and thus far in the New, in our discussion this morning, the kingdom is always referred to as a matter of prophecy up to the day of Pentecost. Ever thereafter, it's spoken of as a historical fact. And any church that can't be spoken of in that way is not the church that Jesus built. Jesus is not the head of it. He does not add the save to it, and he didn't purchase it with his blood. Now, you begin with Revelation. That is the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible. And you trace the events backwards. John, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the Apostle John says, very plainly in the beginning of the book, I am in the kingdom. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 9. When Paul wrote to the young evangelist Timothy, concerning how he should behave himself in the house of God, which is the church of of the living God, 1 Timothy 3.15, the church was a reality for people could live in it and there was a certain way for people to behave themselves in it. Again, the great apostle said to the Colossian church concerning their relationship to God that they had been delivered from the power of darkness. He says they had been translated into the kingdom of God's dear son. Colossians 1.13. You can't be in something. You can't, common sense says you can't be in it unless it's there to be in. In Acts chapter 8, in verse number 1, Luke records for us these words, and we read them. And we read of a great persecution against the church. Well, how can you persecute that which doesn't exist? And as I've said many times in this pulpit and elsewhere, Strange that honest, truth-seeking people can't find the church when those who hated it and wanted to persecute it had no problem finding it at all. In Acts chapter 5 and verse 11, it is said that great fear came upon all the church. Well, if it didn't exist, something's wrong. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 47 that I alluded to a moment ago, the statement is this, the Lord added to the church. Now, those aren't hard words to understand, but they're very significant words. The truth of those words tell us, again, that any church claiming to begin before the first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ, as you read of in your own Bible in Acts 2, or later than that, cannot be the church that Jesus built, the church of which he is head, the church that he adds all those saved from sin by the gospel to. And though this brings us all back to Pentecost. Now, whether you take the old or new dating system, A.D. 30 or A.D. 33, the church, the kingdom, the body of Christ, the family of God was established in Jerusalem. And it's interesting that the Old Testament prophet, Zechariah, said... In Zechariah 1 and verse 16, this prophetic utterance, my house shall be built in it. And that was a shall be. It couldn't refer to the actual temple because there already been a temple there. God raised up Christ according to Acts chapter 2 and verse 30. Peter's telling that in his sermon. 
God raised up Christ to sit on David's throne. Well, David said, I saw in the, or Daniel rather, so I saw in the night visions. What do you see in those visions, Daniel? Behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to, now notice he came to, he came to, not from, but uh, he came to the Ancient of Days and they brought him near before him. Now listen. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Daniel 7, 13 to 14. We often close out the gospel accounts of the life, death, burial, and resurrection, and ascension of Christ. And we think of the disciples standing there watching him leave with the clouds of heaven. Well, 600 years before the actual event, Daniel was given in a vision the knowledge that I just read. Because there's what happened when he was received out of their sight. The coronation of the Son of the living God in the core and splendor of the majesty of heaven. That's something. Christ received this kingdom when he was born heavenward. The clouds bore him up and he came to his father, the Ancient of Days. And his reign on earth began when he sent the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, as Joel had predicted in Joel 2, beginning verse 28, as he had predicted, sent him from heaven to earth on the day of Pentecost. And when they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, it's when they began to utter the words of the gospel infallibly as God put those words in their mouth and delivered them. And the people could, have, could exclaim concerning the words they spake, how hear we, every man in his own language, the wonderful works of God. And so we have the record of Peter's sermon which tells us what the other apostles were saying for the Holy Spirit gave them the same truth each one to say. And they all heard it there in their own mother tongue. So it was a gift of tongues, not a gift of hearing. How hear we in our own tongues? And our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, King of King and Lord of Lords, started reigning on that day from heaven, sitting at the right hand of God. And he will continue to reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. And the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. And I like to think of that coming of Christ described in this way. The day death died forever. And if you read 1 Corinthians 15 where Paul's correcting many false ideas about the resurrection among the church of Corinth you'll see him discuss how long the Lord will reign and that he'll reign till the last enemy is destroyed. Then the scripture says, he shall deliver up the kingdom to God. Now, the kingdom is the church and the church is the kingdom. It was used interchangeably in Matthew 16 when the Lord promised to build his church. I will build my church, he said to Peter, I will give thee the keys of the kingdom. It was rather ridiculous to say, I'll give, I'll build my church, I'll give you the keys, something else. The whole context simply says the kingdom is the church and the church is the kingdom. The terms are used to describe different aspects of the same institution of those Christ saves. So it is that we who have heard and from the heart obeyed the gospel, having believed it, are added to the church by God himself. How do I know that? Because I can read, understand, and accept the truths written in words on my level of understanding of the Bible. There was a time when men went out over this country saying you can't understand this book if you want to. Rather than say who knows what it means. But it sure makes a nice book if it's bound right to sit on the coffee table. And that's where most of them are or if they ever reach that much publicity in the home and they're not found in some bookshelf where nobody's quite sure where it is. 
The Bible has the mind of God written on our level of understanding for your good and my good. And if you can find out when the church of Christ, as that term's used in the scriptures, started and the significance of it, you can find out everything else you need to know about it concerning your salvation from sin and how to live a faithful life and go to heaven. I can't think of anything more that the devil would say is, well, you can't understand that book. Or if you do start understanding, say, are you really sure that's what he says? Or how about this? I know that's what it says, but can't you also do this? Just take him at his word. That's the simplest definition of belief in Christ and the New Testament system I can think. Take him at his word. He said what he meant. And he meant what he said. And so Jesus would say, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. John 12, 48. Now, why would a loving Savior who underwent so much agony and shame and pain to save us say, Well, I'm going to judge you by this book, but <laughs> you really can't understand it anyway, and I'm going to catch you at judgment. Does that sound like for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son? That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. In Hebrews 4 and verse 12, how can you know what that verse says and say, well, you really can't understand it for sure. You might get sort of an idea. When he said, now the word of God is quick and powerful, that's alive and active, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Rather than that, it'll shake us up to realize the power of the word of the living God. And thus Paul said, preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. But he tells us about men. For well, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap unto themselves teachers having itching ears and shall be turned away from the truth unto fables. And so it has ever been among fickle men when it comes to the place and position of the word of God, the seed of the kingdom, the sword of the spirit that is the only true source of faith in God setting forth the way of salvation. Now if you're a child of God this morning you have to know those things and a whole lot more concerning being grounded in the faith. But if you're not a child of God, you can be before you leave this auditorium this morning. It's a matter of whether you want to do what God said the way he said for well, the reason he said it. Well, you need to believe with all your heart that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. You need to repent of your sins, confess your faith in the Christ, and complete your obedience to the gospel by being immersed in water by the authority of Christ into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit to obtain the remission of your sins. More than that he does not put upon you, less than that you cannot do and be saved from your sins. But if you will do it, he'll add you to his church, the church that began, as Luke records in Acts 2 on that first Pentecost, following the resurrection and ascension of Christ. And this one word of warning before we quit. When fundamental first principle sermons so necessary like this one gets to the point with you to where you just say, oh me, how to hear that one more time. You need to do some serious searching of your soul regarding your intent and purpose toward the truth of God and your own personal salvation. Will you come to Jesus while we stand and sing?